So it's nice to meet you. Thanks so much for Good meeting you as well. Me. And you are um, your security professional. You're a writer, yeah. you're a published author, mm -hmm. and yeah. the host of a podcast. Yes. <laughs> um, how did you get into this line of work and why is it interesting to you? So it was by accident. You know, in the, the 90s, I had a, a couple small computer startups before startups were cool. And uh, really, uh, before uh, the dot-com era was really booming or, bop, or you know, popping, so we started, a couple of buddies of mine started a network company and did really well. And we sold that and did another one um, really well by those standards. I don't know that you'd say really well by today's standards. And um, uh, by my third kind of entrepreneurial company, I started to realize that um, I need benefits uh, and some other things. So I started working part-time and uh, a friend of mine said, you know, you can go do this job in retail and it was decent pay and work a couple hours a week and get healthcare. And uh, one thing led to another and retail kind of took off. Uh, and uh, I had a very fortunate career where I, I was in probably the right place at the right time and worked for great people and um, really was able to excel and, and do a lot of fun things, utilizing the technical background and some of the things I learned uh, along the way. So that was uh, the exciting part. <laughs> the writing and all those things came about um, also by accident. I, it was uh, five or six years ago, maybe seven years ago, I was uh, at an industry association event in Seattle at, at um, uh, Microsoft's headquarters, actually, and someone approached me and said, hey, would you ever think of writing? And I said, I don't know how to write. I said, I'm not a writer. I said, that's not <laughs> what I do. Um, and uh, through just meeting folks at industry events, um, you know, the, the editor of this magazine said, well, why don't you write? And, you know, people write all the time. And I, that was really how I started writing. Um, so I started in writing uh, up in a print column for Lost Prevention Magazine and then um, kind of got this column called The Future of Loss Prevention and was started a, a regular, uh, you know, a regular occurrence of writing um, and have had a print, uh, you know, column for years now with them. And that uh, through uh, association things as well, I did some podcast stuff as guests. And I think the industry started to recognize that um, podcasts were a good medium. So through the Loss Prevention Research Council and the University of Florida, we started to do a podcast there. And um, it was co I co-hosted that for about two years. And now just in the interest of time, I do like special correspondence. So I'm on most of the podcasts, but I don't actually, you know, commit to everyone. And then I do a podcast for the magazine and then I do a law enforcement podcast. So podcasts are fun and kind of easy to do. So it, it's much quicker than writing. Um, but that's kind of the, the quick high level overview of how that all happened. So cool. Um, yeah. And so why, why is this interesting to you? Like, why are you so interested in um, retail security specifically? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, I think uh, today I uh, split my time probably between retail and the banking sector and security is probably um, half of it. I mean, wh what interests me is, you know, to solve complex problems. And I think, you know, uh, part of the, ch the challenge with information and technology is as it grew, uh, we didn't keep up with it from the, the security standpoint. Um, physical or traditional security hasn't changed much in almost 100 years, and that's kind of what the book's about, is that, you know, although everything in the world has changed, we still kind of lock doors the same way. We still kind of use the same principles and rules of physical security. And my argument would be in the cybersecurity world, it isn't really until maybe a year ago that we've changed that as either. We've really kind of struggled with running through it. So the interest is in, in solving the problem. Um, and part of, uh, you know, the security challenge is, is gathering intelligence. And that's kind of, you know, how I met the Ecosec platform in 2011 when I was with Bloomingdale's. And I think I was a corporate manager of data systems and investigations at the time. We recognized the need to have a formal process to monitor social media um, and monitor the dark web when no one was even talking about the dark web, you know, before you know, the Silk Road, so the world hit the news before all those things really were hot and heavy. So um, we developed an in-house program with myself and a couple of people on the team 
totally different time at that point. You could really develop an in-house, uh, in-house program. The, the platforms were open. They weren't locked down. They were really easy to write to. So at that point, you could almost get Twitter's complete stream without you know, any, any resources needed. We quickly recognized that, and when I'd say within about a three to four year span, we realized that uh, we could not maintain that. So uh, that kind of set me on this kind of long-term journey of continuously trying to find the best open source intelligence tools that were out there, um, which is what led me to that piece. Um, and why I talk about intelligence gathering is because that's that's where the security starts. You have to learn at what people are talking about and what some of the, the upcoming risks are to try to stay ahead of it. And if you're not constantly trying to gather information, then you miss what I guess the future curve is or some of the tactics and things that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that you were talking about in a recent article that you wrote for LP Magazine as well, using social media um, <clears throat> monitoring, not only to detect um, these risks, but you talked about being able to follow a criminal right from the moment of theft all the way through to potential resale of items just by mm -hmm. using social media monitoring. Yeah, so I think when I, so that's, um, I've, I think I've written in the last five years about four or five articles specific to social media. Now I'm starting to try to uh, explain the difference really now that it really is more of open source intelligence where it's not just your your typical platforms that people think of. And the most um, simplistic and tangible example that people in retail or really in any good services can understand is the following of the criminal at the source all the way through. So it's very tangible for a retailer to understand that. And it also allows them to start to use tools to identify other things. So uh, when I think of open source intelligence, I think of it kind of as a three prong approach is one is, you know, an information gathering tool so that you can um, get industrial intelligence. So I coined that phrase years ago It is really learning about what's going on in the particular industry you're in. Uh, it's not industrial espionage. A lot of people, when they read it, think that's what it translates. But it's really about if you're in big pharma, learning about what's going on in big pharma. If you're in retail, it's retail. It's banking. It's banking. Law enforcement. That's one of the prongs that I think of. The next one is the early threat indicator. And that early threat indicator could be breach, early threat breach, early threat theft, early threat Anything that you would think of as a threat, using utilizing open source uh, intelligence to actually identify a threat, maybe even before it's known or in the very early stages of it. I wouldn't say it's predictive in nature because usually by the time someone's talking about it, it's it's already happened or it's you know at that stage. And then the third leg, which is what I often write about because the readers really follow it, is the investigation side of it, where you can use it um, for. In, in, in investigations process. And one of the things in this article, um, as times were changing, I kind of took the approach of, well, here are the, the most, you know, the, the most commonly used tools, not necessarily the best tools in my opinion. And look, my opinion is just that it's an opinion. So I think it depends on where everybody's at in their journey of what tools. And, um, you know, one of the, the unique things about using Ecosec is that it, it, it allows you to have kind of an open source intelligence tool covering those platforms as well as a dark web tool on the other side with Beacon. And that's not typical. So most of the other options require you to kind of bounce around multiple places and gather information from, you have to go to different sources to get it. So what I like to do, and I, I you know, in this article, it was a very high level, so I couldn't get into it is um, generally what I find is that uh, things related to retail specifically that are on the dark web almost always go back to the open web. They almost always end up originating back to somewhere on the internet that you'll see. That isn't necessarily the case in the financial sector. It isn't necessarily the case in some other verticals, but in retail specifically, almost every investigation I've ever been involved in that's on the dark web actually ends up on the open web at some point. And the article really was to kind of impress upon that that it's, it's another tool in the toolbox to, to have and really look at when you're doing an investigation or when you're looking at it from a threat uh, vector to say, I need, you know, what can I learn about this? Uh, I think the news media always portrays when there's an active shooter that, oh, you know, this was a, there were clear indicators and clear signs, but when you consume intelligence or open source, you would, you would be overwhelmed with the amount of information if you didn't have a tool to kind of parse that out. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to uh, not only access the information, but being able to use advanced filters to really narrow down what you're looking at, because sometimes, you know, there's so much out there that it's hard to, to know what, what you should be looking for. <clears throat> yeah, the advanced filters are the key because if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So with social media monitoring and my first article, which I think I wrote in 2014 on social media monitoring, is that everybody goes to the table and says, I want to hear about everything. Mm -hmm. And then you, you basically create a program that doesn't work. So the filtering is you have to prioritize what's really important. And if you're using it as an investigations tool, the methodology is completely different than if you're using it as a threat assessment tool. And it, again, is probably even completely different if you're using it as an industrial intelligence tool. Uh, and with COVID-19 being out, and I've been doing a lot of conversations about that, it's, you know, adding that back to that industrial intelligence piece of it's a really good way to get information to you. And all of your traditional, what I, I would call your traditional information sources now channel through other channels as well so you can really gather all those things that way and i think if you don't have kind of a filtering tool set or a process that runs into play you're going to miss the things that you're really interested in and i think that goes back to what i said before about if you don't you know if you don't have priorities of what you're looking for uh and you don't segment it with filters you just won't, you won't get tangible, actionable information. And I think today in this day and age, um, however, you know, we're in such an unprecedented time, you start to realize, well, yeah, this isn't just about catch investigations. This is about really gathering information to make business decisions uh, in near real time, like really being ahead of the curve of things that are occurring. And in today's society, I know that in retail, uh, speaking to some of my former peers and some of our customers today, the the avenue here is well, I want to find out what my what my what my competitors are doing, and this is a great way to do it. You know, what are their what are some of the things they're doing from uh, you know possibly reopening stores, who's closing, why, and and some of that data. It's really been valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and you are in charge of retail security for Bloomingdale's, right? I was, yeah. So I was at Bloomingdale's for just about 14 years. And the last, I pretty much uh, in that time worked in most of the roles related to asset protection and loss prevention. Um, when I rounded out um, my time there, I was the director of technology and investigations. And um, it's probably, you know, a non-traditional system, but, you know, non-traditional job with a traditional title. There was uh, probably 30% information and technology and then the rest was really investigations driven so that was where um the bulk of the social media and open source intelligence started because you know prior it really when i started there was when the facebook's and the twitters of the world were just being born you know if you think back uh, a lot of this stuff is still fairly new even google when you really think about it is not that old so mm. i kind of you know i was there in the inception of you know, the heavy e-com and the apparel space and certainly was there during the transition, the Twitter, you know, transition and, you know, the MySpace going away and the Facebook taking over. So lived, lived through that and watched some platforms die, you know, the Google Plus going away and, you know, uh, you know, some of the live streaming platforms that were there. So we really um, got to see uh, uh, over that time the growth of social media and what the impact was on retail asset protection and threat monitoring. And how did your experience in physical security then uh, add to your insight as a digital security professional as you as you move from physical security to then all of these platforms coming you know into the forefront of what you're really looking at? Yeah, so I think physical security mm -hmm. is you know is has a lot of relationships to the cyber world. I, I think it's the the biggest difference is physical security is right in front of you and cyber, it could be this, this big envelope of it. But um, what I would say is what you learn in physical security is education and awareness. The more information that you can get out there and bring in, um, the better you are, the way you educate people, it's, it, it really works the, that well. And then the other thing is access and opportunity to whatever it is that you're trying to protect. That's the physical security realm. And then I think the last thing that you learn in physical security is that there, when there's a physical security threat, if there's access and opportunity 
and a, the, a potential lack of supervision, that's where your exposure is. The cyber world is not actually that much different. It, you just have to take a different approach where the education awareness piece is exactly the same. You have to continuously get information from, from the, your sources and deliver them to the, the, the bodies that make the decision. So, you know, the analogy that I use, which is a simplistic analogy, but is, you know, you know, uh, on the cyber world, you know, having good password hygiene using two factor is the same as making sure you don't let someone use your keys and you set your alarm in a physical store. So it, the principles don't change that much. You limit the access and opportunity. Um, you, you, you can uh, improve that. And that's the same with endpoint management and cyber. That's the same uh, all the way through. So when you take those things into consideration, you, there's certainly a technical acumen that runs through, but the principles of keeping something safe really are about limiting access to your, your goods, limiting access to your, you know, your, your infrastructure, you know, <laughs> eliminating opportunity. It's the same, you know, kind of the same old, same old. And every large breach that you really think about, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a large breach that was super, super technical in nature at the entry point. There might be a breach, you know, we'll use uh, a target breach, for instance, their, their RAM scraper that used was technical, but the way they got it in was taking advantage of access and opportunity and then you know, lack of super, uh, supervision or human error is, mm -hmm. is where everything starts. It's the same exact thing in the physical environment. And when you go through any of the breaches that affect financial institutions or and or retailers, when, when the basic principle is they get in through a door that's not closed correctly, there's a domain server that's not locked down, there is a human error where someone doesn't follow a rule. So they're actually eerily similar. Um, and um, while the biggest challenge or biggest difference is someone sitting tangibly in front of you different, but the way you approach it from a methodology, I really feel strongly about. And actually in both the book and I've written about that, that there, there are such strong similarities in it, um, whether there should be or not, that that is the challenge. And, it's interesting to think it's 2020 and we really haven't been able to solve the riddle of um, taking the human element out, but the reality is we probably never will. So that, you know, we'll probably never ever eliminate that from the mix or, you know, we won't be a part of the process. Yeah, thanks so much for, for answering that. Um, I wanted to also talk about your book um, that was recently published, I think last year, The Evolution of Retail Asset Protection. Um, Tell me about that. Tell me about your book. Who is it for? Um, so it's it, it, the funny thing is it, it's it's probably for everyone. Um, clearly, when you write a book, it's a, a lot of uh, a lot of work and a big responsibility. So um, it, it it sounds silly, but uh, I was sitting in an office in New York City, uh, I I think three or four years ago, and someone said, "You know, your articles are very helpful. You should write a book." And I kind of said the same thing. I'm not a writer. I don't, you know, I don't want to do it. And at, at the same time, in the back of my head, I that would be really interesting if it could help people. Um, at that same conversation, you know, I had kind of this, uh, this was a mentor of mine that I was talking to. I said, I really want to be a professional speaker. And, um, you know, he said, well, you got to slow down. You talk too fast. <laughs> um, but, it, and, and so I set up a, a, this personal goal in, in this conversation of, you know, that I'm going to start to speak professionally. And I'm going to write a book. And I didn't have a timetable with it. I just said, I'm going to do this. And, um, you know, since then, I've spoken you know, up until COVID-19 monthly, uh, both to the law enforcement community, the, the financial community, the retail, um, and some just technical and, and primarily on the things that um, I didn't deem myself an expert on that people kept saying you're helping us with. And social media happens to be one of the things that um, I've spoke about many, many times from the impact it has on the way we consume news to the, to the, the security space to, you know, some of the, the myths and misconceptions. So when I, when I sat down to write this book, I, I, this book is really about the learnings that I've had from all of the people that I've worked with. Um, I would love to take credit for everything, but 99% of it is really much like I think everybody else goes through things that I've learned that I thought would be useful and the book is written in kind of bite-sized uh, chunks of practical things that I've learned and with kind of a quick tips of how to do it. And it's, it's more about information and technology and the evolution that is occurring 
than anything else, but it ties to retail because let's face it, I spent 22 years in that, in that sector. So that's where I had the most interesting stories. But if you, if you took the book and um, looked at it, it starts with kind of the premise of when we spoke a little bit about it is there's a need for change in the, in most security industries because we define things the same way we did in the early 1900s, you know, um, shoplifting, theft, fraud even is defined the same way where we really haven't caught up. And then it talks through kind of the digital transformation and some of the unforeseen challenges that occur. And then, you know, there's a, there is a section on social media. There's a section on the dark web. Um, in, in the book, there's certainly sections on violence and, and data, but it, it's, it's an interesting mix. So the, the, reader, the reader audience that it really has been going to is law enforcement and asset protection um, because, you know, they, they kind of resonate to it because of the title. But um, if I do write a second <laughs> book, which I, I'm not sure that I will, I think it will kind of take those general principles and apply it to the broader picture, especially considering now that I work heavily in the, with the banking and financial sector. And while they're very different, the, the physical security challenges, the cybersecurity challenges, the threat vectors are exactly the same. So that book, if I had taken the examples out of retail and put banking samples in, the application of the methodology would be the same. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. I did read a bit of a blurb um, <clears throat> uh, a couple of days ago, and I, um, I'm excited to jump in and see what you have to say. Um, so I, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate um, you taking the time to meet with me. And you know, I hope that we can jump into some more conversations in the future. No problem. It was great chatting with you. Yeah, you too, Tom. Take care.